In our last episode, we left Vault 76 in search of our Overseer. She left with her own mission to do from vault which we learned was to track down three missile silos, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. We learned that vault wanted to get their hands on them, whatever the cost, and to prevent all other factions from doing so before them. But strangely, the Overseer broke with protocol and asked for our help. Now that we're outside the vault, we need to track her down to find out why. One of the first things we discover when we step outside is a corpse. This is a responder corpse. On her inventory, we find our first weapon, a pipe pistol, and a small amount of ammunition. But what is she doing here? She is gray, and it looks like her corpse is in the beginning stages of decay, but she's not a skeleton. This means that she's in the second stage of corpse decay, the bloat stage. She hasn't yet begun to bloat, but the bacteria in her body has changed the color of her skin, which means she died only three to five days ago. But what was she doing up here? And as a responder, what exactly is she responding to? But it's here where we find our first enemies. Tiny robots wielding a communist Chinese star attack us called Liberators Mark Zero. They're not very dangerous, even though I ran out of ammunition, I was able to pistol whip them all. Now, as I said in our last video, I was only given three hours of access to the Fallout 76 beta, and I had to play it on an Xbox, which might not be a problem for many of you watching. But for a PC gamer like me, it was like trying to swim backwards uphill in gravy. So I beg your forgiveness on the clumsiness of my combat prowess. Now, in the Overseer's holotape, she said that her orders were to make way to the nearest settlement, to find out more about how humanity has fared since the apocalypse. Taking a look at our map, we see a road, Highway 88, traveling east to west, directly south of us. I bet we'll find this town if we follow the road. Now, I was grouped with three other players while shooting this footage. I appreciated their help and the help of the Bethesda dev who was guiding us, but I wanted to see how well I would be able to play this on my own. I was given the opportunity during my trip to sit down at a roundtable interview with the Bethesda devs and ask them questions about the game. In one of their responses, they told me that it's possible to solo the entire game. Now, some of the experiences, especially at higher levels, were intended to be done with groups, like finding the nuclear launch codes and launching nukes, but they reaffirmed that it is possible to play the entire game by doing your own thing. And so that's what I set off to do. So leaving my comrades behind, I wandered off south from Vault 76 until I found the road. The road hugged the nearby river for a while until it turned south. It was round about this time that I leveled up to level two. My strategy at this point was to specialize in strength. I had already learned that I was absolutely rubbish at aiming with iron sights using a controller, so I figured melee was the way to go. Plus the additional strength would increase my carrying capacity, allowing me to carry more. I eventually regretted this decision, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Once we choose a special stat, we can then choose a new perk card. Now immediately after choosing a special stat, we get dumped into the perk cards associated only with that special stat. For example, I'm exploring the strength perk cards right now, and I ultimately chose rank 1 of Gladiator. My one-handed melee weapons now do 10% more damage. But after choosing a special stat, we could back out of this and choose new perk cards from from any of the other special stats. Now, I had forgotten to choose a perk card after leaving Vault 76, so I went ahead and chose another perk, Traveling Pharmacy. Weights of all chems, including stim packs, are reduced by 30%. And that's right, things that never had weight in previous games, except in survival mode, now have weight in Fallout 76, including chems and ammunition. At last, the road I was following crossed a river, and immediately on the other side, we discover the Overseer's camp just off the road. That's right, the Overseer said she was going to pitch a camp. She left a message and a box of supplies. The message reads, Dwellers, and inside a nearby cache is the Overseer's log, C-A-M-P, and a bunch of ammunition and food. Very welcome. Overseer's log, south of Vault 76. I knew this wasn't going to be the Appalachia I remembered, but... Mutated animals? Haywire bots? 
no people so far. We have to be ready to rebuild in... What I can confirm is... Hostile territory. Fortunately, vault Tech was prepared. You see this? The cooking station, the stash box, the workbenches, all built with the camp. You need a home base out there. The construction and assembly mobile platform is designed to give you one. Just add resources, planning, and a little elbow grease. When you move your camp, everything you've built is stored, ready to be placed back down in the new area. Use this to establish a foothold whenever you're in unfamiliar territory. I've left my camp behind so you can use it. I know I'm breaking my own advice by not taking it with me. But after seeing Appalachia for myself, I need to make sure every resident of 76 has a safe haven they can start from. I'll make do without it. If it's still standing, the town of Flatwoods is further down this road. Find me there. This is the Overseer. Signing off. Overseer? Gosh, that seems entirely unnecessary. When we left Vault 76, there was a bunch of extra camps sitting there. It's not like there was a shortage. She didn't need to leave hers behind. Oh great, now I'm worried for her. This holotape gives us a brief introduction to the camp system, which allows us to essentially build a settlement that we can pick up and move around as we need. It is at these camps where we can store our gear so we don't have to carry it all with us, and use workbenches to break down scrap and craft new items. On a workbench, I found a plan for a water pump. The plans unlock new things we can craft using the camp build menu. Then moving to a nearby weapons workbench, I was able to quickly scrap all junk in my inventory, breaking them down to their base components and reducing carry weight. This is something we should do at any opportunity. We'll often find workbenches scattered throughout the ruins. Even if not crafting anything, we should break down all scrap we're carrying just to reduce our carry weight. I took the opportunity to brief engage with the crafting system. As you can see, there is weapon condition in this game. Our weapons will degrade over time, and we've got to keep them repaired. We could also craft new items from scrap. In this example, I'm crafting a combat knife. I figured a fast melee weapon is what I needed most. After crafting our first weapon, we complete a challenge and earn more Atom. Not only can we craft items from a workbench, but as we could in Fallout 4, we can upgrade them and add mods and cosmetic paint schemes. We can place our camp by walking around until the edge of settlement barrier turns green. In this example, I can't build a camp too close to the overseer's camp, so I had to walk a ways. Once placed, this opens the camp build menu. We can now build platforms, houses, and all sorts of stuff. But enough about camps. I'm sure there'll be plenty of time to tinker with them later. For now, we need to track down the overseer. And she said that she left her camp and followed the road to the southwest towards the old town of Flatwoods to see if it was still there. So turning southwest we can follow the road and along the way we bump into a Bethesda dev. We can tell because this guy is level 52. I doubt any of us players could have reached that level in three hours. He was very friendly. He was using emotes to try and tell me that we could trade. So I kind of stumbled around a bit until I found an emote to tell him that I was friendly. And then the trade dialogue popped up. Any player in the game can work as a merchant. If we initiate trade, I can navigate through his inventory. He can navigate through mine. He has a nuclear key card in the miscellaneous section of his inventory. I doubt he'll give that to me. The way it works is you go through your inventory and mark each item at the price you're willing to sell it for. In this instance, he was willing to sell me purified water and Salisbury steak for zero caps. A bargain I couldn't pass up. Thank you very much, Bethesda Game Studio Developer Level 52. Also along the way, it looks like another player, or maybe a Bethesda dev, made good use of the camp system. He built a little shack in the middle of the road, complete with pink flamingos. But we don't have time, we gotta find this overseer. So racing through, we discover the town of Flatwoods. Now in the distance, you do see a big flaming beacon. That was part of a nearby event that my teammates had participated in without me. I went on with the quest. They were doing all sorts of fun things. But even though I didn't participate in the event, I was still able to loot the rewards trunk afterwards. So cool. Don't mind if I do. 
But back at Flatwoods, we find ourselves at the Green County Motel. Heading into the front desk area, we don't see anyone here, but we do see an opossum. <laughs> Ew, and he's mutated. He's got like thumbs sticking out of his fur. Back inside the front desk, we can loot some money from a cash register and scrap from some nearby filing cabinets. Heading back outside, we can go down an alleyway turning left. We arrive at the workout room. We can go ahead and turn off the radio so I don't get demonetized. And here we find a holotape gym sessions notes. Ah, arm day. Three sets of 12 reps. Let's see. Dumbbell bicep curls, tricep extensions, hmm. and back extensions, yeah. A little peeved by the lack of proper equipment. No bother. Chin up. Only eight more luxury coffins to make quota in backwoods. I mean, flatwoods. So, <laughs> uh, be difficult given the uh, financial situation around here. Just need to remind them of our friends, the Chinese. Ah, I'll be back on the plane to Ipswich within a fortnight. Ah, gather it'll be the bench press today. Yeah, again. So an English luxury coffin salesman from Ipswich is here in West Virginia trying to meet his quota. He says that it's going to be difficult, likely due to the financial situation brought on by the resource wars just before the bombs dropped. And so he chooses to use fear of communist Chinese invasion to sell his coffins. Gosh, you must have been a pretty good businessman if you thought he'd be home within a fortnight. But he died here, Preston waits, without even being interred in one of the luxury coffins he was selling to the good people of Appalachia. Upstairs, we find one hotel room we can explore. We don't find much, but we do find our first piece of leather armor. It's only at half condition, but it does improve our ballistic and energy damage resist. We also find a t-shirt and slacks. And interestingly, despite the wonders of vault -Tec technology, it's a superior item to the Vault 76 jumpsuit we're wearing. They share the same damage resist, but the t-shirt and slacks is lighter, though the vault suit is more valuable. But notice here that we can wear both. In Fallout 4, when you equip an Under Armour item like t-shirts and slacks, it unequips your vault suit. But here, you wear it over your vault suit. So here, we're getting the benefit of the jumpsuit, the t-shirt and slacks, and the leather armor. So we'll equip our t-shirt and slacks for now. After looting some first aid from a first aid kit, we can head back outside. It was here that my teammates completed a quest. Now when we're in a party, we can share quests with each other. Even though this isn't the overseer's quest that I'm on, I still got credit for it, even though I didn't really participate with it at all. That's something to bear in mind if you're wanting to explore the quests on your own and you don't want to miss something. But for now, since I have limited time, I'm happy to take the caps. That's about it for the motel. We still have to track down this overseer. So following the road deeper into Flatwoods, we stumble upon a fellow in power armor. This is another Bethesda dev, level 59. And look at this full suit of beautiful chrome-plated X01 power armor. This guy's being friendly, so I went ahead and gave him a thumbs up. And then he hopped out of his power armor to show off one of his weapons. Look at this. What is that thing? It almost looks like some sort of industrial tool. Oh, oh now he's showing off an assault rifle. Pretty cool. I thought for a moment he was offering to allow me to hop into his suit of power armor. So after he showed off an electric drill, I then tried to hop inside only to get a message that the pieces of power armor equipped on this frame are too high level for me. I can't enter the frame until he removes them. He then hopped back in and we saw a bit of a glitch <laughs> and walked off to show off to other players. Heading deeper into Flatwoods, it looks like we're getting close to our teammates. They appear to be doing something in the center of town. But as we enter the center of town, we see a bunch of interesting hearts painted on the nearby buildings. Near to a church, we find a command post. And stepping inside, we find another overseer's cache but no overseer. Inside, we find a camp plan to build vault Tech cardboard standees, like the ones we saw in Vault 76 earlier, and a plan to build a water pump, some ammunition, food supplies, and overseer's log, Flatwoods. Overseer's log, town of Flatwoods. My God, 
There's no one here. The old tavern, the church, people were using them for shelter, but they're gone. Mutations we expected. But there's something else. A disease. I was attacked by... Well, it used to be a person. But it had these green, glowing lesions, and its voice... Angry. Tortured. We are one. What? Whatever happened here is beyond anything we expected. And we expected a lot. Before they were wiped out, the survivors called themselves the Responders. Looks like they were made of firefighters, police, emergency medical staff. They even have an automated system to teach people about treating water, food, survival. I'm doing their tests, and you should too. I know it's even worse than we imagined, but someone's got to know where the missile silos are and how to secure them. The responders are the best leads we have. This is the Overseer, signing off. Coming. It's nice to meet you. Wow, a whole lot just happened there. Okay, the Protectron just said that the Overseer said that we were coming, and then he said it's nice to meet us. So it looks like we're in the right place. The Overseer's description of the mutated creature sounds a lot like a ghoul. But then she did say, glowing green lesions. Could she have met a glowing one? Looks like after the bombs dropped, the survivors who didn't make it to vaults created the responders to try and help people, but something must have happened. And recently, to find all of them dead and having been killed only a few days ago. On top of the radio, we find a water safety report. Tester, volunteer candidate, colonel. Results, germ profile high, and then a bunch of detected bacterial groups recognized, including unidentified bacteria, radiation levels extreme, particulate granules pebble, so there were pebble-sized granules of, what, radioactive waste in the water? Acidity unsafe, pharmaceuticals high. Conclusion, the water is unsafe for drinking unless boiled thoroughly. Oh. So it must have been some sort of bacterial or a viral contaminant. I don't think boiling water removes radiation, or maybe it does in the Fallout universe, I don't know. On top of the terminal, we find another note. Golly Mine Recon. Jeff, I hope things in Flatwoods are going well. I had a thought I wanted to share. If we can spare the personnel, I'd like to send a team into Golly Mine. They were blasting in the days before the war, and if there's still dynamite in there, it might come in handy. I know you're busy with the volunteer program, so it's your call, Maria. So there's a nearby mine, likely named after the Gali River. That must be the river we crossed to get here. Upon looting the note, our map updates with the location of the mine, but we don't have time for that right now. Inspecting the nearby terminal, we see that it's a responder's database. After logging in with a guest account, we read, Welcome guest, Flatwoods Responder services are currently offline. Please use the volunteer bot if you need assistance. Accessing database access denied. We can print a newsletter, and we loot a copy of the Flatwoods Gazette. But I didn't realize at the time that this was added to my inventory, so I didn't read it. Next, we can select Requests. When responders return to Flatwoods soon, we will process your requests. Stay nearby and use the provided emergency supplies and robot. June 15th, 2096? Now, wait a minute. All of these notes are from 2096. That gives us the impression that the responders here stopped operations in 2096. That's only 19 years after the bombs dropped. That means the events we're discovering here happened six years ago. But the corpses we saw would have been skeletons had they been exposed to the elements for six years. Maybe this strange bacteria in the drinking water delays human corpse decomposition. At any rate, in the first one, New Patient Metals, transcript from the Volunteer Bots Records. Everything hurts. Literally everything. I don't even know what happened. I tuned into the radio station and heard about this place, but nobody here knows where y'all went off to. So Metals here arrived at the responder station in this church to seek help. But when he arrived in June of 2096, he found them already gone. And so he left his request on this terminal. 
In the next one, July 18th, 2096, new patient Chris, I was running and broke all my toes, and my nose won't stop running on top of everything. I was getting attacked by some horribly messed up person, and then I started feeling sick. I think he died? His skin was on fire? I kept running. That's when I broke my toes. I'm just gonna lie down a bit. I just feel bad. <laughs> Well, that's terrifying. He doesn't know if the guy died or not, but he was chasing him on fire. Either he's Joshua Graham or some sort of really sick ghoul. In the next one, the very next day, a new comment from Metals, the guy who left a message a month earlier. Yeah, that guy who signed in yesterday with the sniffles and broken toes just died, I guess. He turned to me and said, maybe I ate something bad, and that was it. I'll bury him in the back. This ain't my job, you know. You're welcome. So he's still hanging around, hoping the responders will return. But poor Chris. In the next one, a few days later, on July 25th, new patient, Cullen. I figured I could get some training here from professionals. Survival-type training. I'm going to work on the volunteer responder program. I heard if you get access, you get a bunch of rations and rugged survival equipment. So I'm going to do that. Well, good luck, Colin, but looks like the responders are all away. In the next one, August 1st of the same year, new patient Mike. I used to be a member of a bunker to the east. We had plenty of food and water, or so I thought. People got nervous. There was a fight. Anyway, I left, but I don't have any supplies. I heard about this place on the radio, so here I am. Just here to trade, really. In the next one, the very next day of the same year, we hear from Cullen again. That guy who just signed in took some supplies and left some other supplies in trade. Took most of the water and food, though. He said he was going to some asylum somewhere and would need it more. But he left us with some armor, so that was good. An asylum somewhere? Who would go there in a post-apocalypse of their own free will? Scrolling down, we find another entry. August 14th, same year. New patient, Dr. Venn. I have been eating nothing but Blamco mac and cheese, sugar bombs, and Instamash with Nuka Colas for years, even before the bombs. But lately, it seems to give me the shakes. I'm a doctor, though. A doctor of philosophy, not medicine. So I came here to see if anyone could tell me if there's something I can take for the stomach aches and shakes. Well, he must think those symptoms are coming from his diet. Let's hope they're not coming from anything else. In the next one, written six days later, again from Dr. Venn, sending in some feedback on the robot, it's out of all of its supplies. I've been grabbing supplies from the nearby houses and towns, so there's enough for most of us, but the robots need to be refilled. So the robots were vending supplies, but ran out back in 2096. The next one was hidden off the screen, but we learn that it was written by Brad Hooper. Constant headaches. I was trying to survive up near that old vault tech vault. Had a nice shack by a pond. Even made my own liquor. Things were fine, but then I got attacked by a bunch of giant bugs and now my head is killing me. Just where is everyone anyway? Ooh, so there's a moonshiner shack near to Vault 76? Well, I missed that. Brad's was written on August 25th, but there's one below it. It seems like the responders should have communicated with this outpost by now. Cullen is now a volunteer responder, and he found some resources using the database. He found info in the database that showed us where the responders are now. We're going to find them now. So everyone here at the church abandoned it, presumably sometime in 2096. They found out where the responders were, but didn't share that information with us. Where did they go? Maybe we can find out if we gain access to the database like Cullen did. But how? Next to the terminal, we find a printer we can activate. All it does is print something, but we sadly can't read what we just printed. And on the other side of the terminal is a memo. Responders, the database is now locked. Only volunteers and responders may access it until things calm down again. This is only a precaution until this whole thing blows over and we get back to rebuilding this great country. I just updated it with more information about supplies, so when we get back, we can start distributing resources to the survivors that remain. Delbert and Kesha have volunteered to stay behind to take care of the survivors. DASA. 
So in true American fashion, the survivors of the apocalypse banded together to try to save each other, founding this responders program. But they never returned, though they did leave two people behind, Delbert and Kesha. Maybe we can find some trace of them. And we learned that to gain access to the database to find them, we need to become a volunteer. So, how do we become a volunteer? Heading deeper into the church, we find it littered with corpses. A responder's corpse in a police outfit, and the body of Dasa Ben Ami lying on a stretcher. This is the same Dasa who authored the last note we read. Looks like she didn't get very far. On her body, we find a holotape, Survivor Story, Dasa ben -Ami. We call it the Great War now. It's not been long, and things have been rough. Welcome to Survivor Stories. I'm Dasa ben -Ami, a responder. I've been working with the responders for a couple of years now. I'm from Charleston originally, so it was easy to join up. What wasn't easy was the work. Rebuilding Appalachia from the rubble while survivors flock to us regularly from all over. So many have come and gone. Their stories untold. Their names lost to time. I thought we should preserve this history somehow. I've decided to ask people to record their thoughts, their stories, anything they want to preserve forever. I'll call this series the Survivor Stories. I'll start with me. I was an anthropology PhD student at Vault Tech University, final year. I was printing my thesis when I heard the sirens. I thought for sure my father, a Vault Tech employee, could take us all with him, but only two reservations came through. I refused to go. With my little brother, he went to the vault. They could not persuade me, so they tried. In the end, I pushed them inside it, and that was it. After that, I, I went back home to Charleston and, well, survived. Eventually, the responders formed, and I, I signed up right away. It was so hard. The flood was devastating. Relocating to Morgantown Airport and now Flatwoods has been... I, I remain optimistic. Been with them now for, uh, oh, I guess two years. We have big plans. We can do so much to help. Maybe, just maybe, we can rebuild enough to be okay. And in the meantime, I will continue to record stories of survivors when I can. We are your history. This is Dasa Ben Ami, signing off for now. So she was a student at vault -Tec University, and instead of going into a vault, she chose to stay behind. Apparently, she saw staying in a vault as some sort of cowardice, figured her abilities would be better spent serving people who survived. But well, we learned something interesting. After the bombs dropped, there was a huge flood in the region, forcing her to relocate until she wound up here at Flatwoods. But what was it that ultimately killed her? Nearby, we find a patient on a bed, and next to him, patient chart, Buzz. Patient name, Buzz Yates. Complaint. Patient admitted at 9 p.m. complaining of upset stomach. Drank several containers of dirty water. Claims he likes the earthy taste. Symptoms. Patient experiencing extreme bowel discomfort, weakness, and confusion. He's barely alive. Treatment. The patient died before receiving treatment. Notes. The patient was too weak to survive a simple fall from his bed. Drinking so much dirty water reduced his physical strength considerably due to intense radiation damage and disease. While he didn't die of those issues, simply taking a slight injury caused his demise. While well, whatever killed the responders here must have happened shortly after Buzz here died, if they were able to write those notes on his patient record. At the end of the church is the Trading Post Supplies Protectron robot, where people would go to get supplies, but remember the supplies were depleted by 2096. With smarts and a little luck, you'll do just fine out there while you're 
here, why not grab a stem back or two? But despite what we learned on the terminal, the volunteer bot functions as a merchant, and he does have quite a selection of gear for sale. While we were talking with him, you saw a notification that an event was about to start. The event was called Fertile Soil. We can choose to participate in local events or not. Choosing to participate is a great way to get experience, gear, and caps, but at the moment I'm trying to explore this church, so I'm going to ignore the event for now. Heading upstairs behind the podium, we find a chemistry station where we can scrap all of our junk. Awesome, reducing my carry weight. Thank you. And on the other side of the podium, we find a chalkboard that says Analyze, pointing to a diagnostic terminal. Scientific terminal access denied. This terminal is restricted to responders, volunteers, and volunteer trainees. If you would like to join the volunteer program, speak with Dasa Benami or register at a self-serve kiosk. Well, sadly, Dasa Benami is dead. Maybe we can find a self-serve kiosk? Though, on this terminal, we find a volunteer training program water holotape. Opening it up in our Pip-Boy. This is my first interview with another survivor, Kesha McDermott. She found me trying to break into a Nuka-Cola machine and um, showed me a different way. So, Kesha, can you tell us a bit about how we can make sure our water is safe for drinking? I'll try to keep it to the basics for training purposes. Oh, it's not complicated, really. Find water and strain out any big particles and chunks. Then, boil it in a pot over an open fire for a minute or two, then let it cool. Should be fine. Like... <laughs> like making tea, right? <laughs> uh-huh. You joined the responders a while ago and helped develop a program to train volunteers. So, uh, were you a survivalist prior to all of this? You could say that. I taught high school kids. I used to talk about this very thing to them. Practical application of the sciences. It's fascinating, but you never realize how important some things will be down the road, do you? I guess not. So if we were students of yours, what would you tell us about the world now? How can we survive? That's a good question, Dasa. Well, I would tell you all to remain calm and focus on surviving. The first thing you need to do is get yourself some clean drinking water. It's likely all you'll find is dirty water, but that's okay. We can fix it. Dirty water carries a small chance of disease and it's a bit radioactive. You'll probably survive if you drink it, but you shouldn't take that risk. It's better than toxic water or nuclear waste, though, which are both very harmful and should be boiled thoroughly first. Got that, Dutha? Yes, um, contaminated water should be boiled. Okay, that sounds easy enough. So, boiled water is safe? It's mostly safe, but still a bit radioactive. What you really want is purified water. Oh, purified water. Okay, how do I get that? You can build machines that will do it for you, and that's the most reliable way. Building them requires some space and time and plenty of materials. But on my way up here from Watoga, I found purified water occasionally in supply caches and medical kits. <laughs> so, keep your eyes peeled. If I boil water, and that's mostly safe, aside from a teensy bit of radiation, well, what about tea? Most folks around here are tea drinkers, as you know. I recall many a night sipping tea on the stoop, watching lightning bugs, and reading a book in peace and quiet. Tell me that's still okay, Kesha? Oh, bless your heart. It's probably as good as boiled water anyway. Maybe even better if you add anything medicinal to it. Some survivors add all sorts of flowers and herbs to boiled water, and they swear by it. Personally, I stick with purified water. And to each their own. Hmm, okay, got it. Uh, switching tracks a bit. 
I know you're awfully busy with your latest research in flatwoods. Can you explain that a bit? <laughs> of course! I'm testing local natural water over time in Appalachia. Gathering data, monitoring the radiation and contamination levels, all of that. I analyze the data in my lab to look for long-term trends and use those trends to determine how we can use the water right now. We use the water for more than just drinking, you know. It feeds our plants, which feed our animals, so we need to know how things are changing. You got a lot of work cut out for you. I'm glad you joined the responders. That data sounds invaluable. <laughs> it is. I've integrated the data collection and research into the Responders Survivors Volunteer Program as well. I am still a teacher, after all. Wow. Then there you have it, folks. Thanks for talking with us today, Kesha. And thanks for showing us all how to live a little safer. <laughs> Class dismissed. Wow. And after listening to that whopping five minute long holotape, we now know a whole lot about water. I was hanging out up here because I found another holotape inside this cooler. Survivor Story, Colonel. Hi. Dasa asked me if I would talk about um, how I got here. She asked everybody, so I, I said okay. My, name, my name's Colonel, and I'm 13 years old. I just wanted to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry for everything. Um, the bombs and the messed up people and the cows with two heads, all of it. I was bad. Just bad. I, I cheated on my spelling test. I, I kicked Chip Wilkins in the shins until he cried. I pushed Rosie McCloy down the stairs. Um, I, I cut holes in the bottom of all the gym shorts and I put glue in the mashed potatoes in the cafeteria. I told Harold Newell to eat 10 dead flies a day in order to grow muscles, and uh, I put Nuka-Cola in the rack cage water bottles at the pet store, and, um, I just wanted to say I'm sorry about everything. Because my dad said if I wasn't this way, the bad things wouldn't happen. I, I haven't seen Daddy since the bombs, and I, I guess he left because of that, too. It's okay. I'm, I'm trying to be good now, though. I'm, I'm not old enough to be a volunteer, but Dasa said I could help collect food and water, so I'm getting better, I promise. And, um, Daddy, if you're listening, that overseer lady, I promise I won't be bad anymore, so you can come back now. Okay. Okay. Bye. Gosh, poor kid. If his father only knew what his words did to the poor boy, we can only hope that we don't find his body here. Now we recall on the database terminal that we found by the chemistry station that we couldn't access it until we registered to become a volunteer. We don't find a way to register inside this church. Instead, we need to cross the street to the big red building with the volunteers needed sign outside. It's here where we find yet another responder corpse hanging out of a window. Now let's talk about what we heard on those two holotapes. We learned, as I suspected, that boiling water wasn't enough to remove radiation. It only removed the bacterial and viral contaminants. But it looks like we can build purifiers that can remove the radiation. We learned that the final responder stationed here, Kesha, was an older woman in 96. I wonder if we'll still find her alive. And we discovered two raider corpses in the church, which may explain how the responders died. At the back of this building, we find two check-in kiosks. Welcome Survivor! This program was developed to turn regular survivors into certified responder volunteers. As a volunteer, your job is to help others, and our job as responders is to help everybody, including you. 
Since we know the overseer registered here, and in her holotape she asked us to as well, it looks like we have to volunteer if we're ever gonna track her down. After doing so, we complete a challenge we earn more atom, and we unlock a new photo frame in photo mode, the responder's photo frame. Transferring course to your external hardware. Done. Report to Responder McDermott for further instructions. Oh, okay, so the data on these terminals was transferred to our Pip-Boy, though we didn't get a notification of any note that we downloaded. But our next instructions are to track down Kesha. Perhaps that is what the Overseer did. Now that we're a volunteer, we can access the Responder's database from this terminal. Backing out of registration, we find an option to explore the people directory. First, we find Dasa Benami. She was assigned here to Flatwoods. Her specialty was leadership. She last checked in on September 5th, 96. But wait a minute, that's many months after the notes we read on the Robco terminal in the church. If she had been stationed here all that time, why did all the messages we read keep saying that no one was here? Notes. Leads Flatwood Outpost for the Responders, documenting the Responders' good deeds. In the next one, Miguel Caldera. Job Engineer, Specialty Survival Training Robotics Programming. Last checked in June of 96. Last location, the Morgantown Airport. Oh great, sounds like we have another corpse to discover. Notes installed new self-serve kiosks and automated pantry transferred to Morgantown Airport to build shelters for survivors. In the next one, Colonel, the 13-year-old boy, oh no. Job caregiver, specialty caregiver for children, checked in May 21st, 96, last location unknown. Oh, so we don't know where to find him. Notes joined the responders when he was 13, dedicated to helping kids learn to survive. In the next one, Kesha McDermott. All right, the one we are looking for. Job researcher, specialty hydrology and education. Last checked in September 25th of 96. Last location, Flatwoods River. She was last seen monitoring water safety protocols in Flatwoods, conducting ongoing hydrology experiments. Well, with that, we found her location. Looks like we have to head to the nearby river to find any trace of Kesha. But continuing, we find a note on Cullen. We remember reading about him in the last terminal. Cullen McLeader, job engineer, specialty trying to contact the responders. Last checked in, November of 96, last location, the airport. Notes, trying to contact the responders. Anybody really? Can anyone see this? So he, like we, managed to register as a volunteer and gain access to the network, but he couldn't find anyone. A problem we are having now. In the next one, Scott Shepard, job nurse, specialty knowledge of the big picture, last checked in March of 96, last location, the Green County Motel. Oh, we explored that, but we only found the corpse of the guy from Ipswich. I must not have explored it thoroughly enough. Notes, studying the reasons why, has theories on many topics, mostly political or paranormal. Next, Gary Wilkins, job survival coordinator, specialty courier, last checked in July of 96, last location unknown. Notes, transferred to Morgantown Airport. Looks like we have a lot of exploring of the airport in our future. Next, Delbert Winters, job morale officer, specialty cooking, preaching morale. Last checked in, July of 96, last location, Delbert's home. Notes, runs the Flatwoods kitchens and potluck, trains survivors in food safety. And the last one, Sophie Yates. Job unassigned, specialty undeclared, last checked in July of 96, last location Delbert's home. Notes, student in Delbert's volunteer training class since January of 96. Sounds like Delbert's house is here in Flatwoods, I wonder if we can find it. Backing out of the terminal, we complete the quest First Contact. Interesting that we didn't find a note in the network from the Overseer. Perhaps we can see if the Overseer visited Kesha when we finally track her down by the river. For completing the quest, we get the Responder's Paramedic Jumpsuit, some ammunition, a hatchet, and some healing salve. I tried this Porta Diner, but alas, I failed. We then start the quest, Thirst Things First. 
and our first task in Thirst Things First is to find Kesha by the river. But continuing to explore what I think was a kitchen or a diner, we find a note on the counter, free cooking lessons. Delicious and free cooking lessons, just outside the Flatwoods Tavern in the parking lot. Reverend Dilbert Winters leads cooking lessons every day. Free to all survivors. Come get fed and learn how to cook the old-fashioned way. Menu, Reverend Winter's famous apple chili. Corn pone, yum. Cranburgers, it's definitely meat. Well, probably. At least some of it. Kindly refer to your local friendly responder for details and class schedules. Delbert was the name of the second responder that stayed here in Flatwoods with Kesha. We learned from the volunteer check-in terminal that he was last seen at Delbert's home. Sadly, I didn't have time to search for his house during my three hours, so I never learned if he was still alive or dead. But to continue with this quest, we only have to check in with Kesha by the river. Looks like our teammates completed the event Fertile Soil that we bypassed earlier. On the floor behind the counter, we find two empty settler corpses. And then by the cash register, we find a holotape. Who goes there? Part 1. Welcome back, dear listeners. It's time once again to put aside all you think you know, all you believe to be true. Time to open your mind to the strange, bizarre, and sometimes terrifying world that exists in the shadows and fringes of our own, where myth, legend, and rumor are made real. Yes, it's time for more thrilling tales from the West Virginia Hills. Tonight's episode, Who Goes There? The Strange Encounter in Flatwoods, is brought to you by... Sugar Bombs, the breakfast cereal with explosive great taste and 100% of the recommended daily allowance of sugar. Get your morning started right with Sugar Bombs. Our tale begins on a fateful night when a young pioneer scout, Fred Fisher, finds himself in quite the predicament, having taken a spill and fallen into a dark place. Where am I? Jack? Bip? Mr. Bailey? Can anybody hear me? I can hear you. Who's there? I, I can't see you. Me? My name's Sally. What's yours? Fred. Are you okay, Fred? I think so. My head's a little woozy. Must have hit it when I fell. Oh, no. Did you get lost, too? Well, sort of. What I mean is that I was camping with my scout troop by the lake near Flatwoods. There were these lights kind of dancing in the sky. Neat. I guess. Anyway, we heard some weird noises, and the guy's double dog dared me to go look. So I did. All by yourself? You're really brave. Shucks. Thanks. I followed the noises to an entrance of an old mine. It smelled awful there, like rotten eggs, but worse. Suddenly, there was this bright light shining down on me. I was super scared and ran to the mine to hide, but everything felt strange. Like, my feet weren't even touching the ground. Everything went black, and I woke up here in the dark. That'll happen to me, too. We'll just do what my dad says. When you stray to lost your foot, do what's best and stay put. They said they'd bring him soon. There are other people here? A very good question indeed. Tune in next time to find out the answer in the chilling conclusion of Who Goes There? The Strange Encounter in Flatwoods. Sounds like a local radio play. And we learned that there's an old mine nearby. But Sally, we have heard that name before. We met a little girl named Sally during the Mothership Zeta DLC. And these two stories appear to be connected. The boy in this holotape was exploring with his scout troop when he discovered what might have been a sulfur mine. He said he smelled rotten eggs. But then he saw bright lights, and then his feet felt weightless, and then he appeared in that dark room with a little girl named Sally? Are we hearing a pre-war story based on local reports of a boy being abducted by Zetan aliens and meeting Sally? Holy cow, I hope that's true. 
I want to find out what happens in the next episode. On the top floor, we find another holotape, Survivor Story Tabitha. But by now, I was feeling the pressure of running out of time, so I didn't listen to it. However, we can read some of the notes we found here. On a billboard on this top level, we find a note to Janet. May 4th, 2096. Dearest Janet, oh, how I miss you. I miss your sly smile you'd always wear. I miss the warmth of one of your long hugs. I can still remember how happy we were living together back then, even though now I can't remember your face. I am so, so sorry, Janet. I should have trusted you and walked into that vault holding your hand. Every day for the last 20-odd years, I've been kicking myself for making such a stupid, stupid mistake. It's a hellhole out here. Anyway, this is me finally saying goodbye, and that I'll never forget you, honey. It's getting real, real bad here. I've been waiting for that vault to open so long now and see your bright, smiling face again, but I can't wait no longer. I've got to move on. I should have never taken that job in D.C. Good luck, Janet. Goodbye, and happy birthday, princess. Always yours, James. This could be a reference to Janet Rockwell, whom we met in Vault 112 during the events of Fallout 3. She was trapped in the Tranquility Lane simulation. Perhaps that's the vault he mentioned here. Heading back downstairs, we find a few receipts pinned to a window frame. The mute fruit juice on this menu gives us the impression that this was a functional tavern even after the bombs dropped. Same with the meat in quotes on the next one. In a nearby footlocker, we find a purchase order history. We see that the tavern stocked up on foodstuffs by bartering with local merchants and by scavenging from some of the local abandoned homes. Eerily, the final entry says that they retrieved vegetables from Jill's yard, but they're not sure where Jill is. That was written in November 2096, and we're beginning to notice a pattern. We don't find any notes or memos written after November of 2096. There were a few other things in this tavern I missed, including a terminal that I forgot to come back to and explore. But at this point in my gameplay, I was really feeling pressed for time. Remember, I only had three hours to capture as much footage as I could, and so I abandoned the primary quest left the town of Flatwoods, and ran off to find some other unrelated adventure. We'll pick up with that adventure to see exactly what I found in my next video. But we walk away with a myriad of things to do next. We have to follow the primary quest and find Kesha by the river. We can go and see if we can find Delbert's house to find any trace of Delbert and the other responders that live there. And we could try to track down the other responders whose location we found in the check-in terminal, many of whom were at a nearby airport. We learned of a nearby bunker, a moonshiner's shack, a cave, and an insane asylum. And there was so much lore here in Flatwoods that I was frankly over overwhelmed with documents to read and holotapes to listen to. I can't wait to come back here when the beta is released to connect all the dots to create a cohesive story. Now, we head off to explore something new, but don't worry, I'm gonna publish my next video today. I'm not gonna make you wait 24 hours. If you wanna make sure you don't miss it, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. My designs also come on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, mugs, posters, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon later today with another brand new video about Fallout 76.